today. He holds the um, the Endowed Chair in Disease Control at the Dalai Lama School right next door and is a professor of epidemiology. He's also the director for the Center for Global Health Research and is an officer of the Order of Canada. Um, he was one of the top 40 Canadians under 40. Um, and uh, the Office of the Order of Canada he holds because of his uh, influential work on the development of global health policy. And I've been at the same institution as you for uh, decades, and I'm absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to hear you speak. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Thanks. I'll, uh, what's easiest, stand or sit? Whatever or? you'd like. Okay. Why don't I just uh, sit? That's probably easiest. Okay. Uh, maybe, 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 but I thought I'd shorten it really by just talking about avoidance of uh, premature death. So the idea is not to live uh, forever, but uh, almost forever, by focusing on avoidance of death, um, particularly in middle age. Um, now my definition of middle age changes as I grow older, but it's, I'm going to briefly be talking about avoidance of death before age 70. And I'll start with my conclusions, which are really two, that the extraordinary improvements that we've seen in premature mortality in the 20th century um, do suggest that there are further gains possible in uh, this century. And I'll show some examples for child mortality and adult mortality. And then my uh, favorite uh, topic, as uh, Jeff knows well, is to make the case that counting the dead and describing causes is very central to improving health worldwide and I would like to give some specific examples using uh, global epidemiology and our mortality work around smoking hazards and I'll conclude with those. So historically um, life has been uh, really quite short, brutish, and nasty, uh, nasty as Thomas Hobbes once said. So there was this uh, famous uh, astronomer Edmund Haley that uh, in between looking for comets, decided to dabble in uh, some demography, and he created one of the first life tables, not the first life table, but there are some earlier ones, uh, which basically is a life table, is simply a population, in this case he studied a closed population in Germany, how many people are born and how many die at different ages. And what he established there is this first life table shown that um, most of those born uh, could will certainly be dead before age 70 um, and even by age 10 close to 40 percent of those born were dead by age 70 nearly everyone uh, uh, was dead and that didn't change much when the Registrar General of England started uh, documenting deaths in in England the same patterns that you see is you know, close to about 30 percent of children born are dead before the 10th birthday and um, only about 30 percent or about 25 percent reach age 70. And this didn't change much up until 1910 when there's a substantial reduction in child mortality. Um, and you see that here, that here's the 1860 or so patterns. And if you go back further, if you go back to the Roman times, it was very similar. Most people would face very short life expectancies because of high death rates in childhood and in adulthood. But by 1910, um, child death rates in England had been halved, but still only a minority of people would expect to reach age 70. But by 1960, child rate, death rates in England had pretty much disappeared, um, and, but still only about 60% of those born would reach age 70. And by 2010 now, that's up to 80%. This reduction is due to child mortality, this reduction from 60 to 2010 really is a result of two big factors, maybe three. One is reduced smoking or increased tobacco cessation. The second is low-cost treatments for those with uh, common chronic diseases. Uh, third, you could argue there's been a substantial change in 
in uh, diet in that time period. So that framework about achievable mortality, now that 80% of people born in England and in, in Canada for that matter can expect to reach age 70, uh, and that varies as I'll show you by smoking status, that framework actually gives you the sense, well, where are other countries on this trajectory? Well, then one way to look at it is the 2010 England is your comparison, and the 1960s China, India, Ethiopia look very much like England did 150 years earlier, particularly you look at a place like Ethiopia, uh, which had close to 40% of all the kids born in 1960 were dead uh, by, uh, by age 10. But look at the dramatic transformation that's occurred, particularly in China. China has now got child mortality rates approximating those of England. India has made substantial improvement, but still lags behind. And uh, so the mortality gap has narrowed considerably. But still, in, um, in India, for example, only 50% of those born can expect to reach age 70, in contrast to 80%. So the big global health challenge, and what there's been considerable progress on, is really this idea that can you reach um, high income levels of survival, and survival I'll define as really avoidance of death early in life and in middle age. And the short answer is that although the progress has been more complete in high income countries, the rate of change has been faster in low and middle income countries. Okay. So why is this? Well, most of the, and you have to look at different time periods, before 1950, most of the changes that occurred were really from, uh, not from income growth, not necessarily from uh, organization of services, uh, but chiefly they were from public health discoveries and public health interventions very broadly. And that includes, at that time, improving the terrible sanitation patterns in urban England. Um, but there was also some very basic things. Understanding the mode of transmission was an important role to understand how uh, disease could be interrupted. And you have to remember at that time, we kind of take it for granted, but at that time the levels of ignorance about these things were just considerable. You, you kind of see the, um, the fear when the, the current Zika virus has been spreading in, in um, South America, and it's led to a lot of fear about what actually uh, it might do. Um, well, in 18, prior to John Snow's formative work finding that cholera was actually transmitted through, uh, through water, um, the British Army has in its, had its, uh, its official instructions that in the face of a cholera epidemic, the Army was to march at 90 degrees to the wind. So, I mean, that, that was their prevention strategy. So the role of science was, uh, has been underappreciated, but has been actually quite dramatic. A lot of these understanding the modes of transmission, simple things like hand washing after childbirth uh, that uh, uh, came in uh, by uh, Semmelweis and Holmes. I mean, you read about Semmelweis in the, uh, in the Freakonomics book, but Holmes actually also did the work, and he didn't go mad like, uh, uh, like Semmelweis did. Um, but simple things like smallpox vaccines that were uh, taken from the cow and made into humans were widely, uh, widely accessible. So before 1950s is really understanding the modalities of disease transmission and some very basic uh, drugs and vaccines come. But after 19, and you see that reflected in the American public health questionnaires to cities, this explosion of knowledge meant that what they used to ask cities in the U.S. Uh, in their surveys in the 1870s was very much on things like gas, lighting, topography, burial. By 1921, what they were really focused on is what public health practices are being followed. And so you see this big change that had occurred at that time. Now, after 1950, it's a very different enterprise, which is the introduction of mostly biomedical knowledge and biomedical advances. And these are some stunning examples. Smallpox eradication is one. Smallpox killed one of my uh, late grandmother's uh, 12 children at the age of three. And you know, I told her just before she uh, passed away that did she know that smallpox was eradicated, and she hadn't, uh, she hadn't known that. Um, 
the extended program in immunization, which is giving simple immunization to kids, has raised the proportion of the world's kids that get routine immunization from about 5% in 1970 to about 85% now, and it's avoided a huge number. This actually is a conservative number. Now we're down to about 600,000 deaths. So these extraordinary interventions uh, have been scaled up really rapidly. Oral rehydration therapy that came out of research in Bangladesh. So the net impact of that has been the childhood mortality is really coming down quickly. At 1950 death rates, or birth rates and death rates, about a quarter of children born worldwide would be dead before their fifth birthday. We're now down to about 6%. Now that's still um, about 6 million deaths a year, which is considerable. But one way to look at this progress is saying, well, if the world today had Canadian child death rates, you wouldn't have 6 million deaths, you'd only have 1 million. Conversely, if the world today had the death rates that Canada had just in 1900, you wouldn't have 6 million deaths, you'd have 30 million. So that's been the progress and the opportunity. So global survival is uh, to age 70. Now I'm going to move into middle age, is, is uh, substantially improved. And this is the big question, this is the big public health question that's being debated. Um, and these are the UN new goals for 2030, is what can the world look like by 2030? Well, we've proposed that one thing to think about would be by 2030, you would have the same kind of survival that I showed you broadly for uh, till age 70 as in the UK or in Canada, about 80% of males or females born could live to that time period. Now what would that involve? It'd be involving a cut of 40% in premature death rates before that. On current progress, if things continue, we'll reach about 30%. So it's arguing that more could be done. Well, what's one of the things that needs to be done? It's, it's very simple, is that we don't have good information on how most deaths occur in low and middle income countries. Most of those deaths occur in, not in the hospital, like occurs in Canada, but occurs at home and without medical attention. So, for example, only 3% of the world's children who died in 2010 had a proper death certificate. 40% of dead African children never make it to a facility. So in the absence of complete registration of all the deaths and medical certification, what do you do? Well, you can build those kind of systems, but they take a long time. In Canada, we uh, really, it took about uh, 60, 70 years to do. Uh, in the U.S., up till 1975 in Louisiana, there were still poor black men dying whose, cause, whose death was recorded, but the cause of death was unknown. So it takes 100 years to make this transition. When deaths start occurring in hospitals, and you have systems, then you'll be able to get good medical information, as we do in Canada. But in the absence of that, what do you do? Well, the solution was actually proposed 140 years ago by the sanitary commissioner of the government of India, and uh, he was, uh, I forgot his name, but he was actually exchanging letters with his, his uh, counterparts in the UK, and with, uh, yeah, even Shattuck was about that same time, right, in Massachusetts, I think? Um, Famous yeah, uh, but he was this Massachusetts sanitary commissioner. They were all exchanging letters, uh, and uh, and this solution that he, that the sanitary ca commissioner came up with was simple. It says for sanitary purposes, it is indispensable to know the relative mortality in small tracts, to ascertain the death rates, to see if they are preventable, and to apply the remedies. Well, that's the million death study. That's what we do. So what we've done is work with the Registrar General of India to survey a million homes uh, which are drawn from the preceding census. It's 8,000 areas, a million homes. And we send teams in that are non-medical surveyors. There's about 800 of them. And they go and knock on the door. And if there's a death, they get a simple two-page form filled out, some standard questions on symptoms, and then they get a narrative which is structured in local language. Um, and that's just written down as to what happened. And then this is turned into electronic records and we've got 350 or actually now 400 doctors coding online that each record is coded by 
two doctors. And if the two doctors agree on that, let's say this was tuberculosis, case closed, but if they disagree, then they get each other's records anonymously. And if they continue to disagree, then a third senior doctor adjudicates. And the idea is to keep things cheap. We do this work for less than a dollar a house, study all diseases, and build capacity by working with the census uh, department. And the real magic is simply by going and talking to houses. The new stuff where you've got now electronic entry and you can do GPS tracking, those are add-ons, but they, uh, the, the key thing is the conversation at the door. And this is an example of an actual narrative, um, which uh, obviously we've changed the name, but I'll let you read that, but it describes a very unfortunate story of a young woman who uh, went for delivery at the hospital. They knew she was in trouble, and I suspect the hospital didn't want to have a death there, so they turfed her out and said, you have to take her to Lucknow. The family didn't have money. They brought her home. The professional died. Uh, the midwife wasn't able to uh, uh, handle the delivery. Lots of bleeding. Both mom and child are dead. Now, in this story, you see actually all sorts of things. You get an, a proper diagnosis, which was, this was probably a obstructed labor leading to hemorrhage, which led to the death. But you also see the story that you see a failure of the referral system. You see economic issues and you see training issues. The midwife was simply not sufficiently skilled to be able to handle this. And all of those have an impact on how to improve health services. Okay, um, what have we learned from the Million Death Study? Lots. Just everything that is common in one part of India is rare in another. You can study all diseases. And I'll just give you a few examples. The first of which, which is very controversial, was our findings on malaria. Now, malaria is an interesting disease. It's not something that you can just treat. You can actually cure it. But because you cure people with malaria, it it creates a problem for epidemiologists like me that you can't actually study the death rates because you've cured it. So, uh, however, that's partly for this reason when the WHO, when they made estimates for how many deaths occur from malaria, they relied on properly diagnosed malaria patients and they showed this kind of curve. A little bit in kids, not much in adults. When we knocked on the door and asked the houses um, was there a death? And if so, uh, what were the patterns? What we found is a large number of deaths that were coded as acute fevers. The main thing was the person had fever, but not anything else clearly, not diarrhea or not, um, not cough, because then those would be coded as, as uh, diarrhea or pneumonia. But they just had an acute fever and dropped dead. And so we attributed this to malaria, showing a U-shaped pattern. Now. Disturbingly, in the more contemporary data that we've got, these are the earlier rounds, the 2005 data, the more contemporary data, which I'll show you a bit of, of 2010, shows persistence of that U-shaped pattern. There's good news in that there's big declines in child mortality from malaria, but not much in adults. So now the obvious question is, and our criticism that we got from all sorts of quarters was, how do you know this is malaria? Now we don't. Uh, but we can make some broad inference, and one of them was very simple. We looked at where the malaria deaths occur, shown in red, and then we looked at the distribution of where the government reports the most dangerous type of falciparum, or dangerous types of malaria, which is called falciparum, from their routine reporting. What they do is they test people who show up at primary health clinics with a, a blood spot and try to determine whether it's malaria. Uh, Vivax or falciparum, and you see the striking correlation that where the independent program reported deaths is where we reported, uh, uh, sorry, reported infection is where we reported deaths. And we had other ways of trying to look at uh, these patterns, such as seasonality and the relationship to other infections. So we conclude that it really was malaria. Now that's important because the world's been ignoring this U-shaped relationship, not just in India, but in Africa. In Africa, in Mozambique, a national survey of deaths by getting verbal autopsy showed also a U-shaped pattern. In 
Earlier studies published in the Bulletin of WHO, they showed also a U-shaped pattern, except, for example, in Agincourt, South Africa, where you don't have malaria, there's no U-shaped pattern. Where you have malaria, there is a U-shaped pattern. Now, this is important because this is one of the big global numbers for, uh, for adult deaths, which has not been sorted out. Okay. Um, I'll just skip the child mortality uh, story, except to tell you in the last 10 years, in the million death study, we recorded phenomenal improvements in, uh, in child mortality. The overall death rates have been, have, are down by 40% in that decade. And one way to look at it is what's an annual change, about 3%. And I like to tell this to finance ministers, like you, you, everyone wants a 3% economic growth rate, that's considered good. Well, you can also think about that same way for uh, diseases and for annual improvements in premature mortality. So if you're getting 3% annual declines in child mortality, that's pretty good. But look at the specific conditions for tetanus and measles. It's down by 80% in that decade. Annual change is about 9%. And the reason is simple. The Indian government mounted a second uh, program to try to make sure every kid got measles and that the tetanus uh, vaccines that were given tried to reach all pregnant women and that they were real. Very simple stuff. Huge amounts of corruption, lots of inefficiencies, but if you do things seriously in public health with all of those problems, you make enormous differences. I mean, a 9% exchange rate, that's getting into Chinese growth rates. It used to be, not anymore. Um, so the now, you see this also for adults, but now these are rates over a 10-year period, so you broadly have to divide by about 11 to get the annual rates. But overall, it's about down 1% a year, or about 9% in the decade, at ages 15 to 69, the death rates. And there's good news on particular conditions. Chronic lung disease is down, tuberculosis is down, malaria is, is sad, the death rates are down, the absolute numbers not so much. But look at heart disease and, uh, and stroke, it's actually up. And I'll come back to what that, uh, what that might imply. Um, we can study all sorts of stuff in the uh, Million Death Study, one of which was to have the simple finding that suicide in India is not a phenomenon of older people, as you see in high-income countries, that's this solid line, that the death rates for suicide go up with age and really reflecting chronic underlying mental health conditions. In India, the patterns are a peak in young women and in young men, and then a second peak in more middle-aged men. And this pattern we attribute to basically uh, societal pressures around work or marriage. And this is actually more common in the rich states than in the poor states. So suicide actually kills about four times as many people as people dying from AIDS, but doesn't get nearly the attention. Vikram Patel, who is the lead author of this uh, paper and works with us was named one of Time 100's most important, uh, or one of the Time 100. I use this to recruit uh, scholars to say if you join our study and work with us, you might make that list. Um, now we're able to do some other interesting exposures, one of which I'm sure you've seen the headlines about just the terrible levels of ambient air pollution in India, particularly in North India, for example, in Delhi, which is here. And what we did is, very simply, looked at all of the deaths that we've got, 350,000. We've geocoded all of them, so we know where they occur. And then we overlaid those geographic locations with a, uh, the World Bank's uh, data. This is actually 11 by 11 kilometer grid of ambient air pollution, the small particulate matter. And then you do a simple, you, you join them and, and you can get some estimates of the relationship of, of ambient air pollution and mortality. And what we found is that uh, there's about 300,000 deaths before age 70 from air pollution. That's about the same number as the models have predicted, but the models got it really wrong because they said most of those deaths were from heart attack or stroke, where we find that most of those deaths are from chronic lung disease. And that's important because these imposed Western uh, models onto Indian data and you get these kind of uh, conclusions. And uh, so we're working on this paper now, which I think should certainly shake up 
global ambient air pollution epidemiology. Let me turn briefly in the last uh, few minutes to smoking and uh, more broadly to substance, uh, substance abuse. Well, these you have to take seriously if there's going to be big reductions in adult mortality, and the big ones are smoking, drinking illicit drugs, and uh, now uh, obesity or adiposity. And these are the global numbers of uh, people who are exposed and the annual numbers of deaths. You see, the smoking remains the uh, biggest cause of death uh, among these exposures currently. It will vary by populations, and you know, we can probably say our ex-mayor had actually all of these exposures, um, <laughs> but, and for him, the truth is, even for, at an individual level, the biggest risk for Rob Ford actually would be smoking and uh, deaths. But there are ex important exceptions, and the one most important one is Russia. In most populations, smoking kills more than binge drinking. Russia is different. In Russia, it's because it's characterized by these extreme drinking patterns. And these are Russian men who went out to fish in the morning on the river, but you can see they're having shots of vodka. And you see what happened in the, in the Russian alcohol crisis was also the Russian mortality crisis. And as by contrast, you just look at the death rates 15 to 44, 15 to 54 in the UK, and they showed steady declines from about 1980 onwards. The, in Russia, the high background rates were due to smoking and to health services, but these rapid fluctuations are really due to alcohol. And you look at the extraordinary changes that occur. So along comes Gorbachev, hate to see, he doesn't like seeing all these drunk men and does these simple restrictions on preventing binge drinking, overall death rates fall. He's booted out, along comes Yeltsin, and of course Yeltsin was marketing his own vodka in Red Square, uh, which was, you know, you could get a, a shot in the morning and it was cheaper than bottled water. Um, and the death rates substantially increase and then they come down again, the ruble collapses. So basically anytime there's been big social crises or public health interventions, binge drinking really has been affected. And this was studied very nicely with David Zaritsa's paper where he looked at Russian male death rates in Siberia. And if you want to know what a Russian man drinks, ask his wife after he's dead and you'll get the truth. And that's what the study did. So they went around and they asked, did dead Fred drink? And the cases here were those that drank a bottle of vodka a day. The controls were the ones that drank only half a bottle a week. They, had no, they didn't have any non-drinking controls. So. Uh, so, yeah, the controls are 20 shots a week, uh, think of it that way. And even with this comparison, you see a huge excess in various causes, and interestingly, including in medical causes, and one of them was coded as heart attack, and many people were perplexing, if it's alcohol, modest alcohol, or even large amounts, is supposed to reduce heart disease, why is it causing, um, causing heart attack deaths? When you look at the details, what was that? It was basically coding heart stopped which is, uh, and it was coded as a, as a myocardial infarction condition, but it's basically they drank so much that the heart uh, stopped. Now worldwide, um, obesity is increasing. Every uh, decade, uh, 0.4 units more of BMI is the average increase uh, worldwide. So that, that is of concern. Uh, but still, smoking accounts for more deaths and is a greater risk for typical smoking than is obesity. Well, now one way to look at this is, as I'll show you, typical smoking now involves a decade of life lost. So if I'm a typical smoker in Canada, I can expect a decade of life lost. If I if we want to achieve that same loss of life through obesity, I would have to be really obese. I'd have to have a body mass of around 43, meaning 50 kilograms in my case. With more modest obesity, around a body mass of 32, I'd still have to put on about 30 kilograms. So the, the uh, overall distribution in the population, even in the US, fattest nation on earth, or one of the fattest, is that mostly it's modest obesity, it's not extreme obesity. And even with extreme obesity, you uh, can reduce the risks because the pathways of higher body mass very much involve raising blood pressure, 
making your the, the, the more co bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, reducing your good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, and diabetes. And all of these makes vascular death possible. Now, you can't affect necessarily obesity. We haven't had successful programs to lower body mass in a population, but you can actually act upon these. And, you know, I kind of like to contrast this as this is the Chris Christie slide, you know, the, the governor of New Jersey. He's got a BMI around 43, but you can be sure that he's on secondary treatment. And this is the John Boehner, the previous, uh, smoke, uh, previous speaker of the, of the U.S. House, who's a smoker. And people generally look at uh, Christie and say, oh, he's the unhealthy one. Actually, Boehner's got uh, greater risks. And you can see how much secondary treatment, which is commonly not thought of as a public health strategy, but I believe should, works. And this is very simple evidence drawn from uh, hundreds of thousands of patients being randomized to different combinations. And if you take a typical person who's had a stroke or heart attack or some evidence of vascular disease, meaning they're already diagnosed, and you put them on aspirin, well, there's seven year, one year risk goes from 7% to 5% of either dropping dead or going to the hospital. Add a blood pressure pill, goes to 3%. Add a statin, goes to 2%. It doesn't matter what sequence, but you can take a 7% risk down to 2%. So a 10-year risk falls from 1 in 2 of dropping dead or being hospitalized down to a 1 in 6. So this is a very practicable strategy. And in India, back to the million death study, we found that in fact most of the deaths from vascular disease had a prior history. And the prior history means that you can actually, uh, those are targets for prevention by treatment. Okay, let me turn to uh, smoking. And as mentioned, the 21st century mature hazards now show in various populations that smoking typically involves a decade of life lost. This was not known for women because women have only been recently studied sufficiently that have smoked a long enough time that you can actually document the risk, as I'll show you. Um, and we showed this for the US. These are the Million Women study and Richard Dahl study, atomic bomb survivors, and Indian men, interestingly, that smoke cigarettes already have about that loss of life. And this is, when our study came out, this is how Brian Williams from NBC covered it. And good news and bad news on the smoking front from the New England Journal of Medicine they state flat out smokers lose at least one decade of life expectancy over non-smokers on average. The encouraging news here is quitting before 40 reduces the smoking related death risk by 90% compared to continuing on as a smoker. I love that. That's 66 years of epidemiology in 22 seconds. <laughs> oh, and it's exactly right. Those are the key points. So this is our U.S. prospective study. Uh, using a very novel system that they have there where they do a survey and they link them to the National Death Index. And what it found is that women who smoke like men die like men. Now we're able to study the women who have been smoking seriously like men and they have about the same risks. And you see that in the survival probabilities. Uh, you can't live forever, but living till age 80 is a reasonable proposition, I think, in Canada and in the U.S. And you see the big differences in men that smoke, meaning only about 26% of 25-year-olds that smoke can expect to reach age 80, versus 61% of those that are non-smokers. And this is adjusted for the differences you'd expect between smokers in terms of education or alcohol use, even uh, health insurance coverage we've adjusted for. And interestingly and importantly, the same in women. Women that are typical smokers lose uh, can expect only uh, a 38 percent chance of reaching age 80 versus 70 percent if you're a non-smoker. Well, this pattern of maturing risk is now uh, seeing in other populations. So in China, what has happened is a big increase occurred in production of cigarettes and consumption. And what that means is the Chinese smoking patterns are also going to plateau in uh, the same as we've observed in Canada or in the U.S. Now, thankfully, Asian women seem more sensible than men. They don't smoke very much, so it's mostly in men in, uh, in Asia. And here you see the proportion of deaths in middle age in Chinese men is rising and will reach by 
the estimates from Zhen Ming Chen about 33 percent, same as about here. And as a as a marker, Hong Kong, which started smoking seriously two decades earlier, is already about 33 percent. In India, it's a little bit different because you've got different types of smoking products. Most people, most men who smoke, smoke BDs, the small local cigarette, and that involves a loss of six years of life. There's a few women that smoke and they lose eight years of life. They smoke BDs. And men who smoke cigarettes lose 10 years of life, as I showed you. But as mentioned in the video, the ridiculous news is that the cessation is incredibly beneficial. If you quit by average age of 30, you get back almost all of the 10 years of lost life. Quit by 40, get back 9. Quit by 50, get back 6. Quit by 60, get back 4. And this is important. In Canada, there are many, there's still about 4 million smokers in Canada. Many of them would be 40 and thinking, that's too late for me. You know, I've smoked my whole life. There's no point in me quitting. Uh, but if you can convince them that, in fact, quitting by age 40 gives you back 9 of the 10 years, then uh, they might do so. In India, what's also happened is because the cigarette is displacing the BDs, over the last 10 years, the risks are changing. And what we've shown, and this is in men, the relative risk has increased modestly for all causes, but particularly for respiratory disease and tuberculosis, it's now more extreme than it was earlier. So the risks in India are continuing to grow. Okay, what can be done about it? Just the bloody obvious thing to do is raise the prices. And uh, uh, you see this inverse relationship between price and consumption in many populations, in France, for example, in South Africa. So France is a good one. It took France only 15 years to have consumption from six cigarettes per adult per day down to, uh, to, down to three. In Canada, it took us, in terms of having consumption, about 30 years. And the reason is that in France, they took taxation very seriously. This was Jacques Chirac raising prices 5% above inflation every year, and boom. This effect of plateauing is Nicolas Sarkozy coming in uh, as, uh, prime, as finance and then prime minister. If you look more uh, locally in Toronto or in Ontario, we have not kept up with uh, price hikes. Uh, Rob Schwartz has done some nice work that shows that the uh, Ontario is lagging behind the rest of the country in price hikes. Well, how effective would they be? Well, just look at the French example in greater detail. So prior to 1997, the trends in lung cancer at younger ages, which is a very good measure of recent smoking exposure, were in two different directions. In men in the UK, it was coming down, and the female epidemic had been aborted. By contrast, in France, it was going up in men, and it started to go up in women. But what happened after 1997? Remember, the tax hike was about 1992, so about five years later, what happened? Boom. Look at this huge decrease in lung cancer deaths, and the female epidemic has plateaued. The UK continued to improve. Now, this is not all the effects of tax. They also went from the high tar to the lower tar cigarettes, but mostly it just suggests how effective this strategy is of announcing taxes are going up 5% above inflation every year, and uh, it just led to a big decrease in consumption. Now, France is actually a model of cessation. It's got better adult cessation rates than we do in Canada. Oops, am I stuck? Okay. Um, there's other things that can be done. One of the interesting things that's been introduced in Australia is plain packaging, and that, I think, would be something that uh, Canada should consider, um, which really involves that the only way of advertising the, the brand is the small label Winfield Blue, which is the Australian brand. And this seems to have worked. Canada's done some pioneering work on warning labels, including this one, and there's even some studies that if you hand a pack of Marlboros to men with this on it, they actually say, no, no, give me the one that kills me. I don't want this one. <laughs> so they do have an impact. They do notice. Uh, okay. So to come back to the big picture, where are we in, the, in, in terms of achieving 2030 big reductions in premature mortality? Well, um, you have to look separately before age 50 because that's where infectious diseases like HIV and malaria and TB come in. And 50 to 69 is very much vascular disease and chronic disease. 
And right now, there's about 20 million deaths in these two age ranges. If the changes in the last decade persist by 2030, we'll be down, you know, it'll be about 13 and 17, so about 30 million. So we're down about a third. With the UN targeted gains, this is what we've proposed. We said this actually could go down by 40%, meaning you could have avoid you know, something like uh, an extra seven, eight million uh, deaths by that time period with concerted action. Now, more optimistically, but I don't think this will be achieved, you could aim for a having a premature mortality. Um, that's more ambitious but uh, and probably not achievable. So to help move this along, what are we doing at the University of Toronto? Well, we've got the million death study, but we want other countries to try to adopt the lessons learned. So we formed the Statistical Alliance for Vital Events, which tries to focus on uh, scaling up priorities in different countries. Uh, we're starting in Ethiopia and Mozambique and expanding, and I hope this actually will be the one of the key things in the uh, EDU on global support for the Statistical Alliance for Vital uh, um, vital events. Just you count the dead, you get good information, it helps countries have the GPS to improve their health. That's the basic logic. Okay. Uh, conclusions, just to repeat, enormous progress. We're at probably the most exciting time in, in global health. It's as exciting, I think, as the, uh, for what the physicists are doing in terms of discovering <clears throat> the inner earnings of, or inner workings of quantum mechanics and uh, we're at an equally exciting time. And I would submit to you that the simple description and good epidemiology is actually central to that. If you'd like more information, uh, we do have a MOOC available. It's actually running right now. It's called Death 101. It just If you Google Death 101, you'll find it. It's University of Toronto edX. It's a five-week course running about three hours uh, of instruction a week. It covers much of the topics that I've outlined to you. Thank you. Would you be willing to take a few sure, questions? Sure. Yeah. I have some questions about um, the COPD mm -hmm. and, and the very different patterns you were seeing in uh, India versus here. Is that because of exposure to cooking over fires? And do you We've adjusted for that, but I think what it is is you, um, it just, it's one of these things. If you, the, the relationship of um, particulate matter to heart disease or stroke, uh, or chronic lung disease or lung cancer, uh, those are the big four, pneumonias, uh, was really studied in places like San Francisco and others. Now those places have had uh, not the problems with high levels of background, COPD. So they showed a relationship which was uh, suggested, oh, there's some small effects for heart disease. But it was use of those, now that work was done, and the world somehow, without questioning, said, well, that seems pretty sensible. Why don't we apply those curves to India and China? Now, that is fundamentally flawed because the patterns of disease and the exposures are also quite different. Now, the reason it, this hasn't come to light before is a very simple thing because in India and in China, by WHO definitions, 99% of the population is exposed to uh, unhealthy levels of particulate matter. Like, you know, the, the average uh, exposure in China is about 56 PM 2.5. In India, it's 40. WHO safe levels are considered below 10. So now, if everyone is exposed, even a tiniest relative risk is going to lead to these big differences. So in all of that, people were just focusing on, well, what's the overall numbers? But uh, if everyone is exposed, what you need to do is really get the relative risks right. And this is, I think, what we've done is shown that uh, the relationship is really quite impressive with COPD. You see a dose-response relationship. You see a greater response of those who had previous lung disease than not. And you see a seasonality that it's greater in the winter months. You do the same things with heart disease or uh, with stroke, flat. So I just think that it's just it's a different epidemiology, and uh, if it's true, then it suggests. I mean, for public policy, it still suggests you do things about air pollution, 
but it does suggest that the consequences are very different. If this is true, the Chinese numbers will be substantially different because their patterns of uh, exposure are greater uh, and they've got a very different uh, disease pattern. So it, it, you know, the same kind of method needs to be applied in China. Yeah. Jeff? Yeah. So what was the, I love the acronym for your studies, I have to remember that one, the SAGE thing, but can you just talk a bit about the difference in collecting data in, in lower income countries versus higher income countries? I mean, I really like your idea of like, you go to the deaths in, in lower income countries and you use a very different design. Like yeah. we have things like the Ontario Health Study, which yeah. is like, you recruit people and you take blood and you, you know, and it's like it's a, a, a sort of a cohort study. And yeah. So. Where's the tipping point where you go from one type of steel and getting out of yep. think? Well, you know, I think the right thing to do, and I'm delighted that uh, David Henry and Laura are working on this Optimize project, yeah. which is, you know, long time coming, but let's look at what's happening with deaths in Ontario. Yeah. Well, what systems probably should do is deaths are an extraordinary resource that are probably understudied. Yeah. Um, if you can build systems that ideally get countries eventually to having a, I would say the U.S. system is stronger than in Canada, because what they do is enable research like this. You know, the National Death Index uh, in the U.S. means if you get consent, you can flag anyone and figure out whether they die and you get the death certificate, uh, which is extremely useful. Um, so. The systems have to think about, well, you, there's, a, there's no tipping point, I think, it's just the systems get built. Yeah. The, the major challenge is that for low and middle income countries really will be that when deaths, most deaths start occurring in hospitals, then you can start using the kind of systems we use routinely here. China is doing that, China now has moved to that, but China has actually gone one step ahead because what they've got is a national health insurance number, a single number, which um, when Zhen Ming Chen started the Chinese Kadori study, blood-based uh, cohort of 500,000, like the Ontario Health Study, he didn't know about this health insurance number. Since he's got it, he's able to link to those, yeah. and he's doing a genetic case control study of 30,000 stroke deaths, ischemic hemorrhagic. It's just, you know, it's fantastic the amount of knowledge that can come out of that. So the, the goal of SAVE is actually to think right through all of these systems issues, but then you focus on what you need to do in the interim. In India, that system might come in but 10, 15 years hence. So in the interim, you do uh, sample surveys like we're doing. Same with Mozambique. Uh, and then when, when deaths become routinized... That's right. Then, then you do that. And in Mexico, with whom we collaborate, they have uh, now quite a good death registration system, but it varies whether you've got insurance or not. So we're working with them to analyze their data, focusing on smoking deaths, with the goal of trying to say, well, what are you learning from those? So, um, you know, just dead people are a huge resource that we don't, we don't really use. Uh, and the idea that I think if you do that, you can build systems, um, and there will be a, a gradient. Now, my sense is, just like every other technology curve, the developing countries might go really fast on some of these innovations. In India, uh, we've worked with the people who've introduced the national ID number, and um, if that gets linked to death, you would have an enormous, in fact, we'd have better information than we do in Canada. Yeah. During your presentation, I was thinking, one or two, just one or two thought about it, I'm sure I'll have to make it a bit. I would say the data you present is uh, powerfully speaks to the impact of uh, public health and behavioral mm -hmm. interventions. Although in medicine, we tend to uh, the field of medicine tends to emphasize biotechnological uh, innovation. It's I would say that your data is, uh, highlights the the impact of public health and behavioral interventions seems yeah. to me in reducing mortality. The other, the other thing is that by looking at pre well, there's two other points you're making, I suppose. One is about learning from the dead, which really is is um, predicting the future from the past, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is point, I guess, is that by looking at premature mortality, the data is a little bit skewed to what happens earlier in yeah. life. Yeah. Um, now, uh, 
if, if we were in another, if you were speaking to another audience, yep. you might have emphasized, uh, for example, the rise of non-communicable disease and cancer, particularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, people, people emphasize uh, the biggest risk factor for cancer, actually, I think even bigger than smoking, is age. That, that, uh, yeah. Age really shouldn't be thought of properly as a risk factor because, right, right. well, um, there's a beautiful paper by uh, Richard Dahl and PETA, which you can actually Google, called There's No Such Thing as Aging. And it's one of the last things Dahl does. Now, what Dahl makes the point is that um, for cancer, aging uh, represents basically the, uh, a marker of the cumulative effects that occur uh, from basically your cells having uh, the probability of turning, uh, right. turning cancerous. Right. But that's simply a function of the time exposed. If, you know, and you get a curve like this, but if I change that exposure curve, for example, by heavily being exposed to asbestos or being heavily a smoker, then right. it suggests that, yeah. You know, so we that, can say that about wrinkling of the skin. We noticed it in old age, but it yeah, there's, actually, there's a biologic begins, process. Yes. But now the public health way of thinking about this is well, if you think about uh, particularly uh, compression of morbidity and mortality in older age, what's needed to basically have a good life and then have a short illness before you die? The things that are needed are in fact reducing. Uh, the occurrence of disease and the key risk factors in middle age. So there is a connection, you know, if you, uh, if you want to be healthy in old age, then reducing risk factors, the key exposures, not being hypertensive, not being diabetic, not smoking, will have an impact in older age in terms of your, if you're going to be sick, you're going to be uh, less likely. It also has an impact on cancer rates, not all cancers, but some, most yeah, cancers. I, I, what you're saying makes, I agree with you, it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would say that might, and the other point I might make is this way of thinking emphasizes prevention heavily. Uh, well, I want to be, not to be seen as a purist, because <laughs> I believe in treatment. I believe in secondary treatment is really quite an effective public health strategy. You know, more, if you look at the percentage of Canadians that are eligible to be on a statin and aren't on it, it's ridiculously high. Yes. The only other point I would make is that uh, this data doesn't take into account suffering. Mm -hmm. It's about mortality. And yeah. um, could one make an argument that, that um, to the extent that it's cumulative, uh, in that sense, it may not be preventable in the same way that some of these diseases, yeah. and that this focus, if, I would not underestimate this focus, obviously, but, but, but how would we justify from this data the emphasis on the relief of suffering? Well, yeah, that's fair enough. Data There's, data. Uh, if you look, however, at uh, premature death rates across population before age 70, they map very strongly to premature disability uh, for most conditions except for mental health and some musculoskeletal. But for everything else that, you know, if it's, uh, it's, it's going to cause serious disability, it also causes serious mortality. There's a very strong correlation of there in the global data sets. In high-income countries in Canada, you will get some divergence but I would argue that the right way to think about it is, well, you know, we worry about um, cumulative disability, then you have to think about what, what are the key things that drive that, particularly at the ages where you can avoid them. And it would probably come back to the same sets of things that reduce mortality. So mental health is the one exception that I think needs special attention because you, that's not captured adequately in mortality. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, I liked how you um, prefaced the talk with uh, using sort of the the trajectory of sort of mortality and um, and how we could use that to to kind of predict the future. And um, I guess one of the things I really liked in early slides was how how you uh, used the UK as an example, where like like this one where you'd shown sort of 1700s to 1900s to 2010, and you see these this evolution in mortality curves yep. with um, with improved public health and reduction in transmission of infectious diseases. And then, when you'd shown sort of the curve of countries like India and China, mm -hmm. how um, even now their curves are still very much looking like uh, the curves in the UK, sort of 
50 to 100 years ago. Yeah. Um, having just, I guess, myself come back from India about a month ago, I, I noticed an, an oxymoron in that the country itself still ha lacks a great deal of infrastructure and, and public health interventions in large part because of, like you said, corruption and the different things going on there. But it's also one of these countries where there, there's huge contrasts with mm. huge advances in technology and science and I think um, a growing capacity for sort of young um, people to, to really try and um, improve on all sort of socioeconomic yeah. standards. And so um, I guess more a question or comment that I'm trying to look at is, can the trends we've seen in the past with the UK also be applied um, to countries like India? Could we expect to kind of see with the same kind of um, interventions that have been yeah. um, viewed there in, in future in, in this country? Yeah, well, I think certainly for child mortality, that's already happening, right? I mean, you just look at the extraordinary improvements and the big increase in immunization that's occurring and for child mortality, that's already happening. Child mortality will look very similar in many countries pretty soon. That's what Bill Gates wants to do before he retires, is get you know, world child deaths down. For adults, it's different. And adults both involve more diverse diseases and more challenges. In India, there's a particular growing problem with uh, diabetes and vascular disease. It's actually just it's extraordinary, uh, extraordinary risk. But there's also challenges in terms of what I've showed you is an average for a billion people. If you really want these things, you really have to look down into smaller areas. And this, for example, contrasts the risks of death below age 15 and 15 to 69. And you see that for child mortality, there's a classic described north-south gradient. For adult, it's not a north-south gradient, it's an east-west gradient. We have no idea why. There's some suggestion it might be historical malaria or other things, but it suggests we really need to investigate, epidemiological investigation, figuring out whether there's, there's risk factors. There's some suggestion that it's the uh, adult height attainment is lower in eastern India as a result of childhood uh, malnutrition. So that might have a, a consequence. So. Uh, in terms of core interventions, we know the things that have worked here, reductions in smoking, uh, low-cost uh, treatment, um, I mean, as the major ones, are very applicable to India. But other things, they do need more research to try to figure out particular interventions. And then there's that whole issue of how you deliver these services. That's really quite complex, which I won't get into. Yeah. Um, yes? I wonder, I, I understand for a public health experts that they would like to extend the life and increase the uh, decrease the mortality of the children and so on in the world. Is there any target of maximum? Um, why my question target of maximum? How how far you want to achieve? this uh, better yeah. uh, survival because it also relates to the sustainability of the earth itself, right? Yeah. For example, the food yeah. Yeah. Uh, and opportunity for people to live um, yeah. comfortably and so on. Yeah. Um, do you have, um, maybe from statistical study and so on, how far you want to go? Your idea. Yeah. Well, I think the, the key thing there, the key lesson of epidemiology is you can't avoid death in old age, but you can, <coughs> excuse me, in middle age. And if we had a, a scenario where most deaths are occurring, you know, well, well past 80 or about 80, and that um, they occur with the minimum amount of uh, pain and suffering, then I think that's a reasonable outcome. This idea that you know, we're going to live forever and you're going to push these frontiers out, I think A is not biologically plausible, nor is it particularly desirable. I think, you know, just being uh, old and, uh, and frail isn't necessarily a, an outcome that uh, most societies would accept. Um, and if you look at the, the 
transformations that have occurred, um, that wouldn't be an unrealistic goal is to, to have as a measure to populations avoid or deaths early in life should be rare, deaths in middle age need not be common. And one crude way I look at this is, you know, The Economist has uh, the obituaries in the back. And a couple of years ago, I just tabulated the average age of the obituaries in The Economist. Uh, these are generally famous people that have had long, interesting lives. And the ab average age was around 82. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, well, if, you know, if The Economist thinks it's reasonable and to reach till age 82, then um, that wouldn't be a bad aspiration. Um, now to get there, the issue is you don't get there by saying, I'm going to be unhealthy till 70 and suddenly I'm going to be healthy. <laughs> you, the, the key strategy in the public health ones are the uh, introduction of uh, good nutrition, early childhood immunization, all of those things I do believe have an impact. And then in middle age, where the world hasn't paid it enough attention, treating and reducing risk factors. All of those would mean, you know, when you're 70, you're much likely to be uh, healthier and um, have a better quality of life. So they're, I think they're, they're connected. Most societies would agree, though, that you, you don't want... Um, 90. Yeah, you don't want 95 or 100 as the <laughs> aspirations because uh, um, for other reasons, those will be more social dependency and need in those older populations. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That was Pleasure. fascinating. Thank you. Um, and can we give you another round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was fascinating.